All right, guys, this is going to be the uh, first video for a push on Monday, uh, March 9th. Um, sorry, I couldn't be here today. I stay home in the sun, so I will uh, be back tomorrow. But we're going to get some notes done today for uh, US for a push US you know, US history. Um, so I have a few video notes, and I'll, this will go out and remind later today. Um, DBQs are due today. That's still going to ha happen. So make sure your DBQs are turned in the back. Don't get up right now and do it. Uh, while the notes are playing, but if you didn't do it already, by the time the video ends, make sure your essay goes in the back of the room, and I'll collect them first thing on Tuesday morning. Um, so make those, make sure those those are done. Okay, so we left off with Truman and some of the uh, after the war effects. We talked about baby boomers, and we got into suburban growth a little bit. So I'm gonna start here. I think that's where we all kind of finished on Friday. Uh, so let me just kind of read from here. But uh, despite the need, uh, so I'm sorry, there was a desperate need for housing after the war. We mentioned that there was a lot of pent up demand. People come back from the war, veterans needed homes. They had, had gotten married, but didn't have a home whenever they left. Or maybe they were living in an apartment until the war ended. So there's a big need for homes. So this is going to lead to a large suburban explosion. A lot, of, a lot of suburban homes get built in this time period. We talked about William J. Levitt uh, making a lot of these homes, if you see the screen up here. Uh, he made these very cheap, mass-produced homes to meet that big demand. Um, he made a bunch of Levitt towns, like up near New York, uh, thousands of homes that cost about $7,000 a piece um, to buy. So anyway, and also a lot of veterans come back, have the GI Bill to be able to buy cheap homes. But the biggest thing is that, which you want to be aware of, is that more Americans are now moving towards suburbs. So by the, in, by the 50s, most Americans are now living in the suburban areas of the country, uh, more so than cities, more so than rural areas. So low interest rates on mortgages that were tax deductible allowed an easy move from cities to suburbs, um, even for people of modest means. So low interest rates on mortgages that were tax deductible allowed an easy move from city to suburbs for a lot of people, even modest people. In a single generation, a majority of middle class became suburbanites. So in one single generation, because people are moving here in the mid to late 40s to the 50s, um, you're going to see most Americans transition to living in suburbs by 1960. By 1960, 60% 60 of Americans live in suburbs. So by 1960, 60% of Americans live in suburbs. And this goes back to the, the people doing very well that we talked about after the war, that people have more money now, a lot, there's a lot of prosperity after World War II. With more money in your pocket, you can afford to buy a car and commute to work. Um, you don't have to live close, and so that's that's these are all reasons why the suburban growth happens. Uh, the negative effect of this is that it does a lot of damage to the inner cities because these folks leave, they go into the suburbs, and they leave a lot of the people in poverty or people who are poor behind, especially minorities. And so these inner cities of you know major cities across the country: New York, Detroit, Chicago, Boston, wherever. It led them with less tax money. They had less tax money because there was a big migration out of it. Um, and so if they lack tax money, they can't pay for things like roads or bridges or education or maintenance or improvements. They, they're going to lack basic services or schools won't be as good. So while a lot of middle class folks benefit from having money to be able to move out, it does very much hurt a lot of people living in cities. By 1960, about 23% of Americans are living in poverty. So it's a pretty big chunk of Americans living in poverty at that point. It also leads to a lot of racial divide in the country. It results in this phenomenon called white flight. So think about how white flight occurs. Whites would have more chances to get better education, better opportunities at jobs. Thus, it's easier for whites post-World War II to move into the middle class or be middle class, whereas minorities don't really have that opportunity. So a lot of whites are able to move out of the cities, move into suburbs, um, and they're very predominantly white, and they can keep them that way by basically not selling to minorities either. They don't have to sell their houses to minorities to keep those neighborhoods white. If you ever seen Raising the Sun, the play of the book or whatever, um, it's about that very issue. This black family trying to leave Chicago to go move in a suburb, and whites don't want to let them do that. So there's a big fight over that in, in, the, in the story. But anyway, all this is an effect of suburban growth. But key element here I told you on Friday too is that make sure you have the word conformity now. Conformity is very big um, as a theme, and so those those mass-produced homes 
uh, really represent that theme of conformity where people felt very comfortable acting and behaving the same way after World War II ended. And we're going to get to why later on with like the Red Scare, but that was a very big theme to act and behave the same way. All right, last thing on the slide is rise of the Sun Belt. Last thing on the slide is rise of the Sun Belt. Sun Belt refers to like a region. Uh, Sun Belt essentially runs from coast to coast. It's like the real true south. The parts that are hotter and warmer and have less winter, hence the name Sun Belt. So uprooted by war, millions of Americans had made moving a habit. Many people were able to afford to and move during and after World War II, not just like African Americans with the second wave of the Great Migration, but millions of people had moved after and during the war. Warmer climates, lower taxes, and, ec and economic opportunities uh, were the cause of these moves. So warmer climate, lower taxes, and economic opportunities made a lot of people move. Especially during the war, there was a lot of defense industries or factories or bases built in the south or southern regions because of the better weather. So because of defense-related industries being built in these southern areas, uh, it, it attracted many GIs or veterans to come live in these areas or in their families. And so Sunbelt ran from Florida to California, but it was those lower states, the real true south of the United States now, all the lower areas because it's warmer there more year-round. Um, and so this, this, the effect here is that it leads to a power shift. For the longest time, as you know from U.S. history, most of the population lived up in the north, northeast. So like Mass, uh, Massachusetts, New England area, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, all those areas where most of the population lived, the west and south was always a lot lower because it's like farmlands and uh, just in general less people. But because of the war, it got a lot of folks to move to like California or the West Coast or down south, like to Texas or Florida. And that's important because when they do census, it's going to change the way that Congress is shaped. So now you have um, those southern states or western states and their ideologies being showcased more in Congress and being more influential now because there's more people living there, right? So it's going to have a profound effect on American politics moving forward. And it kind of helps redraw the political map a little bit and how – Politics are shaped in the United States. So, anyway, that's that's all part of it. Uh, I'm going to change the slide real quick. Give me just a second. All right, so we're going to look at some of the post-war activities and politics of Truman and people related to Truman in those uh, in the late '40s. So Truman was a moderate Democrat uh, who was thrust into the presidency. Uh, he had a very quickly mature into a decisive leader. So he was a moderate moderate Democrat who became president very quickly. Um, and Truman matured into a very decisive leader whose basic honesty and unpretentious style appealed to average citizens. So he was a very basic, honest guy, had an unpretentious style that appealed to very average citizens. And he wasn't that far beyond being very, fairly average. He was, you know, he came from very humble beginnings, kind of a self-made businessman, not a rich guy by any means, but very kind of average, normal politician. You know, thinking about it, he might be one, you know, the last president was really kind of like not that wealthy and became president. Because even after, this is one of the reasons why like presidents get uh, retirement stipends and stuff now because after he was president, uh, he didn't have a whole lot of money and he ended up like basically going into debt. And so the government created this, you know, retirement policy for presidents. So now they get their money after they're president too, going back to Harry Truman in the 40s and 50s. All right. Anyway, uh, he also has a very famous... Um, slogan on his desk that says the buck stops here, which refers to this phrase to pass the buck. To pass the buck refers to like to pass the blame for something that happened. Um, so instead of so basically he's saying the buck stops here, he's not going to pass the blame to anybody else. That whatever he does or says, it's he's going to take responsibility for because he it, he can't pass it on to anybody else. And as president, you're going to see him want to kind of continue on the tradition of FDR and do more big government more New Deal style programs. So let's look at some of those programs. So next I have economic program and civil rights. Truman's economic program and civil rights. His proposal for full employment and civil rights for African Americans faced conservative opposition from Congress. So his proposal for full employment and civil rights for African Americans faced conservative opposition from Congress. So his proposal for full employment and civil rights um, for African Americans face conservative opposition from Congress. And not just from 
Southern Democrats. Southern Democrats, his own party, are part of that, but also Republicans. Um, so he's going to face a lot of backlash, one, because he's the first president to come out and push for civil rights for African Americans and actually try to make you know more equal rights and those kind of things. But because people in his own party in the South don't support that, he's going to have a hard time getting that passed. What you're also seeing, though, happen for Republicans and for Democrats, at least the conservative ones, is that once World War II is over and the New Deal is over, we spent a buttload of money in both those events. We spent a lot in deficit spending. And Americans are just kind of tired of it. Like They're like, all right, we did a lot. We need to kind of tone down this budget, tone down the spending. So there's a big shift to be more conservative after World War II. And so when, it, when Truman tries to come out and promote like an FDR-style New Deal program or having a more active government, people begin to say, like, all right, we got to take a break. It's like it's been too much for too long. We need to start slowing down some of the spending. Anyway, so that's kind of where the, he's going to face opposition, which kind of limits Truman throughout his presidency. Next thing I have is the Employment Act of 46. The Employment Act of 46. In September of 45, Truman, this is right when World War II ends, Truman urged his Congress to pass a series of progressive measures um, so in September 45, Truman urges Congress to pass a series of progressive measures, things like national health insurance, minimum wage increase, so things like national health care insurance. So he's the first president while in office to call for like national health care insurance, which that's still a fight even now, like with Bernie trying to promote that today. So he calls for national health, health insurance, minimum wage increase, and a bill committing to full employment. So the World War II is over, so obviously there's a spike in unemployment. Uh, the New Deal is over with as well, too. So FDR is like, why don't we continue to have something like this where the government continues to spend money so if there's a lack of jobs, it creates jobs for folks, even though it's not the Great Depression anymore, even though it's not uh, wartime. So anyway, he, uh, he promotes this idea of an unemployment act to have full employment for um, people who don't have jobs. Congress will pass a very watered-down version of this. Congress does not want to spend all this money providing jobs for people just to have. So they passed a watered-down version of the Employment Act. First, it created the Council of Economic Advisors. It created the Council of Economic Advisors to counsel the President and Congress on means of promoting national economic welfare. So it created the Council of Economic Advisors. It created the Council of Economic Advisors to counsel the President and Congress on the means of promoting national economic welfare. So he created the Council of Economic Advisors to counsel the President and Congress on means of promoting national economic welfare. But that's basically it. It didn't, it didn't create the jobs or the, like a job program like WPA that Truman wanted, kind of like New Deal style. For the next seven years, a conservative Congress and the Cold War would limit Truman because it's either the conservatives in Congress want to kind of reduce the scope or the Cold War, the Red Scare, all that will distract Truman and his agenda. And so he's not going to have a lot of success passing a very liberal progressive program like he wants to pass. So we're going to stop video one there.